Okay, well, let's go ahead and do the, the review for the final. So the final exam, you can expect between uh, 55 and 60 questions. All right. So a little bit larger than, than you guys are probably used to for exams in this class. I'm going to cover a lot of material. It, it, it's going to be kind of a difficult exam. I, you know, I, won't, uh, I won't lie to you guys. It will be kind of a tough exam. Um, it'll be cumulative. We'll cover everything that we've done. There won't be anything that we haven't covered, though. Um, that's, that's a little different from my classes. Is um, I don't test on things that I haven't personally covered, at least in this class. Um, so that's kind of unique to this, this final as well. So everything that you have on the test will, will have been covered. Uh, what you can expect, you can expect a lot of math. There will be a lot of math on this test. Um, and a lot of material will come from the first five lectures. Uh, those are the most important lectures. Uh, the reason being is because my thesis for this whole class was to get you guys ready to do what next semester? <coughs> Clinicals. To get you guys to be able to safely administer and understand the, the basic pharmacological principles um, of what you'll be doing next semester. So that's really what the focus will be on. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and just go through some selected information. I, I'm not going to give you know, any answers to any of the questions per se, but I'm going to cover the material that the questions will, will cover. Okay, so the introduct introductory uh, stuff, the first going way back to the first le lecture. Um, we talked about math. Are we good with uh, medical math? Are we good with conversions? Are we good with percentages? Lots of medications we give in percentages. Uh, things like mucomist, albuterol, you know, 0 0.5%, 10, 20%. Um, are you guys good with things like 1 to 10,000? What that means, if I give, let's say, 1.25 milliliters <coughs> of a 1 to 10,000 solution, how many milligrams am I giving? Or if I give five milligrams of this, how many milliliters am I giving? So just some of the basic conversions that we've done. <clears throat> uh, dosage cal calculations. Uh, pharmacokinetics. So I'll go ahead and erase this. So pharmacokinetics versus pharmacodynamics. So kinetics. Kinetics versus dynamics. What do you guys think as far as uh, comparing and contrasting these two? Pharmacokinetics is what? Well, kinetic means what? What the body does to the drug. Okay, it's what a body does to the medication. Body does to the med. Right, the med's moving through the body, right? Kinesis, kinetic is the movement of the medication. Um, how many phases are there of kinetics? Four. And what are they? Um, absorption. absorption, good. Distribution. Distribution. Metabolism. Metabolism. And elimination. Good. Uh, what are what is pharmacodynamics? Okay, so it's the mechanism of action, right? It's what the medication does to the body. It's the mechanism of action, how it works, what the side effects are, and of course these two, kinetics and dynamics are are interrelated. Um, because as the body moves through, as the drug moves through the body, it's metabolized into active metabolites, and then the active metabolites have their specific um, actions, right? Okay, are you guys good with uh, certain interactions, such as an additive? We talk about additive interactions, we talk about synergy, we talk about potentiation, okay? Um, all all f should be uh, familiar terms. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the side effects, are you guys good with some of the, the basic what we call the ADRs, the adverse reactions, the side effects of the medic, some of the common medications that we give. Uh, we should be f pretty familiar at this point. Okay, what uh, when we talk about metabolism specifically, we talk about the metabolism of a medication specifically, what organ are we talking about? Liver, Liver primarily. Um, what uh, oxidative uh, system is involved in the liver? What's the big system? Lots of, lots of different enzymes. Almost every medication you can think of, um, it goes through this system at some point or another. Very important. Very important enzyme system. Micro, it's called the microsomal oxidative system. 
what's the name? I'll take a look at the formal name of that. That is a cytochrome P450 oxidase. You guys remember that? The CYP450? Okay. Yeah, got to know that. The CYP450, the cytochrome P450 oxidase system. Um, and it does specifically talk about it in the book as well. The, the, the microsomal oxidative system, right? CYP450. I'm not going to ask you guys about specific enzymes or specific pathways of this system, but I do want you to know that this system is obviously associated with the liver. It's a very large system of enzymes, and it is metabolically active. Many, many, actually most of the medications that we administer go through uh, this system at some point or another, involved in, in metabolism <coughs> in the system. Okay, um, primary organs of secretion. So we talk about secretion, or my primary organs. What's, what's the primary way we excrete medications? The kidney, right? The renal. Yeah, that is the primary renal. We can also have a secretion through the GI tract. We can also have secretion through the skin. We can have secretion through a certain mucous membranes, uh, GI tract primarily, and we can have secretion through our lungs. All right, good deal. So that's most of the, oh, uh, half-life. Are you guys good on half-lives? Are you guys good um, on bioavailability? You guys remember what bioavailability is? What do you guys think? What I'm actually going to require you to do for the final is I'm going to require you to take bioavailability and combine it with the T1 half, or the 1 half T, the half life. And I, I'm going to require you guys to be able to do math that way. Okay? Are you guys good with that? Okay, so let's say that I give you guys 1,500 milligrams of drug X. Okay? That drug X has a bioavailability of 0 0.5 and a half-life of 10 minutes. All right? How much of that drug is going to remain in the body after 30 minutes? That's the kind of question I'm going to be asking you guys. In 30 minutes? Yeah. So what's the first thing we need to do? <coughs> what is 0.5 again? Sorry. That's a bioavailability, 0 0.5. Right, bioavailability, right? Mm -hmm. I need to realize that only half of this medication is going to get into the body, right? So what's half of 1,500? 750. 750. So that's actually what will get into the body. And then after 10 minutes, half of that will remain, right? Mm -hmm. After 10 minutes, half of that will remain. And then after 10 minutes, half of that will remain. Uh, that's the kind of math I'm going to be expecting you guys to do. And it's simply being able to recognize, hey, not all of the medication that I give somebody is going to get into the body, right? There's a certain bioavailability associated with it. I will give you the bioavailability, I will give you the half-life, and I'll give you the initial dose that you guys give. You don't have to worry about calculating any of that, okay? So, you might run into a question like that. Uh, rights of medication administration, are you guys good with the rights? Okay, good. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about um, aerosolized medications, or the, aer the aerosol uh, theory that we talked about. Um, so, in 1905, 1905, what person published three groundbreaking papers? Three groundbreaking papers were published in 1905. Who was the person that published them? You guys, you guys remember? Groundbreaking. This was groundbreaking. This changed the world. This is the beginning of a new revolution in the way we think about the world. Einstein, right? Einstein. He published three papers. What were they? What were those three papers he published? What's that? So the first one was on special relativity, right? Special relativity, the photoelectric effect, the photoelectric effect, and Brownian motion. Which one of these papers has direct relevance to pharmacology, specifically the pharmacology of aerosolized particles moving around in the respiratory tract? The third one. The third one, Brownian motion. What is Brownian motion? 
diffusion and um, yeah, it it's the lowest. It's well, it is involved in the diffusion. It is not the actual diffusion. It is involved in the movement of particles. Right? And what Brownian motion is, is a random particle motion, right? It's a random motion that particles have. They're kind of moving around randomly all over the place because they have a certain amount of kinetic energy. They're moving around randomly. And if I were to say I have my airway here, <coughs> and I were to have a whole bunch of particles here, this end of the airway, they're all randomly moving around, right? They, are in, they have Brownian motion. They're moving around here, 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 here. Eventually, that random motion is going to cause them to diffuse out into the lower airways. Would you guys agree? Mm -hmm. um, that is part of, obviously, it's not all of it, but it is part of the diffusion process. This stuff was not in your book. It doesn't talk about Brownian motion specifically in your book, uh, but it is so important to uh, respiratory therapy, what we do. Um, I included it in your lecture on the aerosolized particles. We talked about aerosolized particles. And you may be asked about Brownian motion in other classes, perhaps lecture. So that's another reason I threw that in there. Um, okay, so we're good there. Um, the last uh, five to six uh, uh, generations of uh, airway, so the lower airway, last five to six generations, what size of particle am I going to, what's the optimal size of a particle to penetrate those airways? One to five what? Microns, good. Okay, one to five microns. Any smaller than that, and what will happen if it's smaller than five? <coughs> there we go. It, there will be no deposition. It'll penetrate very well, but it won't deposit. Particle will go in, and it'll just whoosh, be blown right out. If it's bigger than <coughs> five microns, what will happen? I'll have inertial impaction occurring in the larger airways, and the particle won't penetrate to the smaller airways. So does it kind of make sense why, you know, things like deposition, penetration, diffusion, um, Brownian motion, they're all kind of interrelated, and they do help us understand why I need to give certain medications certain ways. Okay, what's the optimal breathing pattern for good deposition, good penetration of these lower airways? Slow, Slow inhalation, and inspiratory hold. And inspiratory hold. <coughs> good, good. Do we often get our patients to do that? No, we don't. We often do not. Okay, um, let's go on to the nervous system. We talked a fair amount about the nervous system, and most of the medications that we give uh, involve the nervous system one way or the other, uh, for the most part, because we give a lot of albuterol, we give a lot of Zopinex, we give a lot of atrovent, and so on. Okay, so ner nervous system. We have the central, right? I have the central nerve. You remember this picture because we've, we've drawn a few times. You have the central and the peripheral. Okay. The somatic, right? Somatic. Do I have a ganglia on the somatic? Is there a ganglia on the somatic? No. It is what, what they call a one nerve system. That's not quite true, but it, it's true enough for, for what we're learning here. What is the neurotransmitter associated with the, the somatic nervous system? ACH, acetylcholine, and it attaches to what kind of receptors? Um, to nicotinic receptors on muscles. Skeletal muscle, right? Skeletal muscle. Okay. And we call this synapse here. Synapse is a very special name. What is that special name? Mm -hmm. Special name for the synapse here? The neuromuscular junction, the NMJ, or you may hear the term in motor plate or motor end plate. That is a specific term to the nicotinic M. You don't have to remember the subtype of receptors, just a nicotinic receptor of skeletal muscle. Okay, I also have the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system, <coughs> the branches. Do these branches have ganglia? Yes, they do. I have a ganglia. What is a neurotransmitter in the ganglia? ACH. ACH. All preganglionic neurotransmitters are acetylcholine. What is the postganglionic neurotransmitter of the parasympathetic? ACH. ACH. And what two receptors do we have with the parasympathetic? I have the nicotinic and the muscarinic. Muscarinic re receptors are primarily where? 
glands, and they're located in the heart as well. Nicotinic receptors are primarily located where? Smooth muscles, the uterus and the lungs. Really big thing there. Okay, good. Sympathetic, uh, what is the post-ganglionic neurotransmitter of the sympathetic nervous system? Norepinephrine. Norepinephrine primarily. And epinephrine as well. We know that norepinephrine and epinephrine are very related. Okay, what three receptors do we primarily talk about? Okay, the alpha, the beta 1, and the beta 2. Alpha receptors primarily work where? Okay, vessels, right? Okay, so smooth muscle vessels, beta 1, the heart, beta 2, lungs. All right. Um, also, what other organ do we see a lot of beta 2 receptors in? Uterus. Uterus. All right, good, good. Okay, um, when we activate sympathetic receptors, there is a cascade of events that occur. Are you guys familiar with that cascade of events that occur, the basic cascade? So here I have my cell. I have my, we'll say that we have a beta 2 receptor here, okay? And I'd say I give, uh, I give a sympathomimetic agent of some sort, albuterol, what have you. It attaches to that receptor. What does it do to that beta 2 receptor? Hmm? What does it do to the receptor first? The receptor changes... It's confirmation, right? There's a conformational change. It changes the shape, and then it activates something in the membrane. What, what does it activate? G proteins, right? G proteins are activated. G proteins, in turn, then activate what? Adenyl cyclase. Adenyl cyclase. And adenyl cyclase helps catalyze the conversion of what? ATP to... CAMP, cyclic adenosine monophosphate. That is what I will be asking. Uh, nothing more than that, though. I don't want to know any of the intermediate uh, molecules, any of the intermediate pathways, or any of the intermediate area um, enzymes. Uh, beta receptor, conformational change, G proteins, adenocyclase, ATP to cyclic AMP. And CAMP is associated with what? Bronchodilation. CGMP. CGMP is associated with bronchoconstriction. Good, good. All right, all right, good, good. I was showing the uh, EMS guys, uh, the pharmacology you guys have to do, and they, they were uh, glad that they don't have to take the pharmacology you guys do. I was like, yeah, because it's a little, little, more, little more molecular, a uh, little more molecular biology and some, some biochemistry in there. Okay, but not too bad. All right, um, what is the basic structure of the catecholamine molecule? There are three components that I look at. So say it again. Okay, so I have the benzene ring. Okay, so I have my benzene ring. Okay, my hydroxyl groups. And then my amine side chain. Good. Those are the three components. All right, so the, of the bronchodilators, I have three primary classes of bronchodilators. What are they? Of, um, and I should uh, qualify that a little bit. Of the sympathomimetic, the sympathomimetic bronchodilators, I have three types. What are they? What do you guys think? So I have, first of all, I have the catecholamines, right? The catecholamines, which are the catecholamine molecule. The catecholamines. The catecholamines. What are some examples of the catecholamines? Uh, not norepinephrine. Right? We don't give norepinephrine as a bronchodilator, at least. Oh. Epinephrine is one of them. Albuterol, is it considered a catecholamine? No. It's very similar, but it's not quite a catecholamine. So epinephrine, what's that? Okay, racemic epi, yeah. Racemic epi. Norepinephrine is, is, is it is a catecholamine, but we don't give it for bronchodilation. We're talking about 
bronchodilators <coughs> here. Epinephrine is the big one. Uh, what about isoephrine? Yes? Yes, isoephrine. What is characteristic of these guys? They short or long acting? They're short acting. They're very short acting, right? How many hours? One to three hours? Right around in there. One to three hour duration of action. And are there lots of side effects? Yes, there are lots of side effects because they're very non-discriminatory in the receptors they, they attach. They attach to alpha, beta, a one and two, right? So I get the whole spectrum of side effects that occur. Okay, so then I move on and I become a little more discriminatory. And what is the next set of catecholamines? What was developed next? Starts with an R. Re Resor Resorcinols, right? And what are the two major examples of resorcinols that we have? First one starts with a T. Terbutylene, right? Terbutylene. What's the other one? You guys remember the other one? It's called alupent or meto protenerol, right? All right, meto protenerol. Resorcinols, are they a little longer acting? Yes, right, right around the four to six hour. Do they have less side effects? Generally, a few less side effects than a catecholamines. Okay, and then what do I have? It starts with an S. The salogenes, right? And what are the two major examples? Two major examples of salogenins? Albuterol, right? Albuterol. Albuterol and Lev albuterol or Zopinex. All right. And Zopinex, how is it related to albuterol? It's an isomer, right? Albuterol is a mixture of two isomers, the right and left-handed isomer, right? Or what we call the enantiomer. One of them doesn't really do much, right? And actually, there's some evidence that it may be harmful. The other one is, is what's active. Um, we take and isolate the active isomer um, of albuterol. We call that leave albuterol or Zopinex, right? And we know that if I have a mixture that is a one-to-one -one mixture of right and left-handed enantiomers, what do we call that? Racemic, that's the word that we use to identify a one-to-one, a 50-50 -one, mixture of right and left-handed enantiomers. Okay, good. Like racemic epinephrine, for example. Uh, okay, um, you guys should be familiar with the different, um, when we kind of covered them, the different uh, alpha, beta one, uh, beta 1, beta 2 receptors, what kinds of interactions we get there. Okay, um, you guys should be good with terminology as well. If I say adrenergic response, or I say sympathomimetic response, you should be able to recognize that I'm asking for the same, I'm asking the same question, right? Those words mean the same. Uh, likewise, if I were to say cholinergic response or a parasympathomimetic response, you should recognize, okay, those are the same. I'm asking the same thing. So you should be good on your terminology. Um, okay, let's talk about the inflammatory process real quick or um, what's relevant to us. So I have uh, what kinds of cells? I have my mast cells. Okay, mast cells. When they degranulate, what is secreted or released when they degranulate? Histamine. Histamine. And that is associated with what type of response? This is the early phase. The early phase. And what do we use to treat the early phase response? What's that? These are rescue medications, right? These are rescue medications. These are salogenins, our resource and alls. Uh, we typically don't give the catecholamines as much anymore because of their side effects. Okay, and uh, what substance in the cell wall uh, is a problem? Arachidonic acid, right? Arachidonic acid. And arachidonic acid goes through two pathways. What are the, those pathways called? The cyclooxygenase. And the 
Lipo oxygenase. Right. Okay. Uh, cyclooxygenase pathway produces prostaglandins. Prostaglandins. And the lipo oxygenase pathway produces leukotrienes. Okay. Prostaglandins are associated with bronchoconstriction. Leukotrienes are associated with airway inflammation. All right. I have leukotriene inhibitors that I can give. Montelukists, or what's the other name for that? Singular. Prostaglandins, not really a whole lot that works here, right? Um, are there some medications that work in this pathway that can potentially cause problems for asthma patients? Not steroids. Think of um, NSAIDs like aspirin, right? Aspirin blocks certain enzymes, right? We have COX-1, <coughs> the COX-1 and COX-2 enzymes, and aspirin blocks the COX, well, it blocks them both, actually, but COX-1 is, is the one that's, that's concerning. Okay, and we have medications that are called COX-2 inhibitors, like Celebrex, um, that uh, work similar to aspirin, but they leave the COX-1 um, enzyme alone. Okay, we got those. What is a common medication that we can administer to prevent this late phase response? The steroids, right? And Pulmacort is one of the big ones. What is the standard dose, adult dose for Pulmacort? 0 0.5 milligrams or 500 micrograms. Okay, good, good, excellent. Um, all right, what's the other name for Pulmacort? Budesonide. Good, good. All right. Good. Doing good there. Um, let's go ahead and talk about uh, diseases, specific diseases that you might see. RSV. Are you guys familiar with RSV? Mm -hmm. Respiratory syncytial virus, right? What is uh, one of the medications that we can use, or the antiviral medications we can use? Ribavirin. Ribavirin. And how must it, what uh, modality, what device do we use to administer? Spag. The SPAG. What is SPAG? Small, Small particle aerosol, aerosol, aerosol generator. generator. Good. Okay. Uh, what is PJC or PCP? It's, it's kind of like a pneumonia. It is a pneumonia. What causes it, though? Um, the immunity, the impairment. What is, what is the organism, though? It's not bacteria. No. Um, HIV doesn't cause... No. HIV makes you prone to getting it. getting it. But what is the organism? PJC. The pneumocystis, right? This is a pneumocystis gerarvacil pneumonia, or sometimes PCP, pneumocystic pneumonia. Okay, those two terms mean the same thing. So is this a virus? Is this a bacteria? Yes. It is? No. It's protozole. <laughs> it's none of the above. Bacteria are what? They are prokaryotic organisms, right? Protozole organisms are eukaryotic, okay? They're eukaryotic organisms. So they're cells that are actually more related to plant and animal cells than they are bacteria. Uh, what is the uh, medication that we can give to help prevent this? Pentamidine. pentamidine. What special device do we need with pentamidine? Respigard. The Respigard 2. Two. Okay, good. You guys are good there. Um, what is the major prodrug that we run into? Starts with a B. No, actually, I threw that question out. Yeah, I know. You guys didn't get it wrong. Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna. Do, yeah, we're gonna make sure. I'm gonna make sure you guys are good on the pro drug. So B I T. What is that pro drug? B I T. O L T E R O L. But on the test, you said it was. But remember, I threw it out because it was wrong. Remember, so that was, that question got thrown the, out. This yeah. is, what this the is the pro drug, says, right? Yes. Yeah. This and this is right out of the book too. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And so this like, this is the pro drug. Okay. So yeah. Get, whatever that whatever other one was. was oh, yeah. Remember, everybody got credit for that question. Right. Got, right. I just wanted to okay. Yeah. So, are we good that. on this though? We're good on yes. this being yes. the pro drug. Yes. What is a pro drug? <laughs> it's honesty, I guess. 
Okay, so a prodrug is something that I give that's inactive, right? And it doesn't become active until it is metabolized into an active metabolite. So this little guy here, for example, um, a narcotic agent that is, a very, is more or less a prodrug would be something like codeine, right? Codeine is, needs to be metabolized into its active metabolites. And some people metabolize it well, some people don't. And people that don't have lots of problems. They get really nauseated, they throw up, and, and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, mucolytic agents. What are the three mucolytic agents that we run into quite often? Acetylcysteine or mucamist, okay. How does mucamist work? It breaks down the disulfide bonds. Disulfide bonds. It disrupts disulfide bonds, okay. What other, what else can we use mucamist for? Overdose of? Tylenol, right? And what is the shorthand version we see for Tylenol sometimes written? How is it sometimes written? Acetaminophen is a generic. And you'll see it written like this sometimes, A-P-A-P, -A -P. okay? That means acetaminophen. How about aspirin? Is there a shorthand version of aspirin? What is that? A -S -A. Acetyl salicylic acid, A-S-A, -A. okay? Um, that's probably handy to know as well. Um, the certain type of antidepressants, the TCAs, the tricyclic antidepressants, you'll sometimes see that as well. Uh, okay. Um, Okay, so we got mucamist, acetylcysteine. What is another one? Pulmazine or Dornase alpha. Mm -hmm. And uh, what certain diseases do we often see pulmazine? Cystic, Cystic fibrosis. fibrosis. You guys cover that very well today um, in your presentations. Okay. Um, is there another uh, mucolytic, but it is an off label mucolytic? And you guys should know what off label means sodium bicarbonate. Sodium bicarbonate. Um, and do you, can you identify sodium bicarbonate? Is it sometimes is it always written at, like this sodium sodium bicarbonate? Do we see that written often? What's the other way we can write that chemically? Baking soda. Because yeah, no, <laughs> baking soda is a powder, right? Yeah. It's not in an aqueous environment, so it would it wouldn't be proper to call it baking soda. What is sodium bicarbonate? So it's sodium, right? It's a, it's a polyatomic ion, first of all. It's a polyatomic ion. So it's sodium and bicarbonate. HCO3 negative, just like that. Sodium bicarbonate in aqueous. Okay, we got that. Um... Let's see here. Oh, um, talking about metabolism, redox reactions. What are redox reactions? And they are one of the most important types of reactions that we have with metabolism. So redox, redox reactions. What does that stand for? Redox stands for reduction, right, reduction, and ox, oxygenation, oxa, oxidation, okay? You guys should remember this from chemistry, reduction and oxidation, because they are so critically important. What is reduction? What's basically happening with reduction? I'm reducing something, right? And when I reduce something, I reduce its charge by adding what? What do I add to something to reduce its charge? To make it more negative. What are negative? Electrons. Somebody said electrons, right? Electrons are negative. Electrons are negative. If I add electrons to something, I reduce it. That is basically um, what happens. I'm adding electrons. Now this might be in the form of adding hydrogens because hydrogens have you know electrons. I'm adding those electrons to something. But what we need to know for, for this class is I'm adding electrons. Oxidation is taking away electrons. Yeah, I'm taking <coughs> the electrons away. 
So reduction, I'm reducing the charge, right? How do I re we reduce it by making it more negative? How do I make something more negative? I have to add electrons to it. Oxidation, I'm taking the electrons away, okay? We call it oxidation because oxygen is an electronegative atom and it often does reduce because it likes electrons. It likes to take electrons away. But other things can oxidize as well, like nitrogen, carbon, and so on. Okay, you don't have to know that though. You just have to know reduction, oxidation, <coughs> redox reaction. Everybody's okay there? Redox, reduction versus oxidation. Um, okay, let's see here. Uh, uh, um, oh, narcotics versus sedatives. Let's talk about that real quick. There was actually a lot of confusion on the last test <coughs> over what we're talking about here. So narcotics, <coughs> narcotics versus sedative hypnotics. Okay, so uh, what receptors do narcotics primarily work on? The mu, the kappa, and the the delta receptors, okay? The mu, kappa, and delta receptors. And these are called opioid receptors, right? Mm -hmm. The opioid receptors. So narcotics are all, always, off, are, um, uh, can also be called opiates. Okay? We have natural opiates derived from the poppy, right? We have the natural from the poppy, and then we have synthetic. Natural opiates would include things like morphine, right? Okay. Synthetic would be things like Demerol and fentanyl. Okay. These do what? What are these considered? What do they do? Why, why would we give somebody a narcotic, an opiate? Why do we give it? Why do I want to give some pain? I think it's pain, right? Pain. And that's called decreasing pain, that is analgesia, right? Can I get sedation, however? No. Yes, these can sedate. But that is, is that primarily why I give a narcotic? Okay? So if a physician says, I want to control somebody's pain, that's why we give these, right? Mm -hmm. If a physician says, I want to sedate somebody, okay, we look at the sedative hypnotics. Yes, we can sedate with narcotics because they do cause sedation. That's a side effect of a narcotic. But we don't necessarily want to sedate our patients, right? Narcotics are primarily for pain, for analgesia. Sedatives. Okay, sedative hypnotics. What neurotransmitter are we primarily talking about here? Neurotransmitter. Starts with a G. GABA, right? GABA, amine butyric acid. Okay? And it depresses the central nervous system and it does that through the ionotropic receptors and it allows chloride to go into the cell and it alters the potential, right? Um, you guys don't have to know uh, how that, we, you don't have to actually draw, you don't have to draw the diagram that we went over and how it becomes more negative and how um, I have a bigger uh, delta G gap. You'll have to know that, just have to know that we have central nervous system depression. Okay, works on GABA. What are some examples of sedative hypnotics? Benzodiazepines are the biggest class. The benzos, and of course we know benzos and GABA go together. What are some examples of benzos that we give? Lorazepam or? Okay. Has a very long duration of action, right? Ativan, very long duration of action. Okay. Valium. What else? Hmm? Valium. Valium. Mm -hmm. Or? Um, what's the other name for Valium? Diazepam. Diazepam, good. Okay. And what's the, probably one of the more common ones? Midazolam. Midazolam. <laughs> Sometimes it's called Versed. Okay. It has a short duration of action, right? Or shorter, much shorter than lorazepam. Okay. Um, can these cause a respiratory depression? Can these decrease the blood pressure, cause hemodynamic changes? Yes, they can. Can the narcotics as well? Yeah, yeah, they sure can. Um, the, 
the uh, natural occurring uh, ones like morphine, more so because they cause histamine to be released. Uh, the synthetics like fentanyl, do they really decrease the blood pressure all that much? No, not really as much as something like morphine. Okay, um, what conditions would we give benzodiazepines for? Or are set in hypnotics? What kinds of reasons? Why would we give these? Okay, if somebody's intubated, right? To help relax them, help decrease their anxiety. Will these decrease pain, however? These will not decrease pain. So if somebody's in pain, yeah, they may need sedated, sedated a little bit, but if they're in pain, we need to make sure that we cover them with a narcotic as well. Um, optimally, what, what do we want? Optimally, we want a patient that has his, his or her pain well controlled that isn't sedated. That's the best case scenario. They're awake. They're functional, they can communicate, but their pain is under control. That's the, the best case scenario that we can, we can hope for. Okay, anxiety. Uh, what other condition can we give these for? Somebody has epilepsy that has, what do they have? Seizures, right? If they have seizures that are hard to control, we can give these. Okay, seizures, seizure disorder. Um, something called status <laughs> epilepticus, where I have seizures that continue to go and go and go. Alrighty, uh, I want you guys to go ahead and review CPR. You guys have taken CPR, right? No. You have not taken CPR yet? No. Wednesday, Wednesday. Wednesday, okay, good. I want you to pay very close attention to CPR because there may be some questions that work their way into this test from CPR. Um, but not in the way you think. I just want you guys to, to think about what is most important if you have a patient um, that has a cardiac arrest rhythm, okay? What is, what is the most important thing? And pay very close attention to the question there. Uh, okay, um, I know I should have covered this earlier, but when we talk about the, uh, the neurotransmitters of the peripheral nervous system, we have norepinephrine, epinephrine. What two enzymes help break those down? COMT and MAO, right? Monamine oxidase. Okay, good. What enzyme helps break acetylcholine down? ACHE or acetylcholinesterase. Okay, good. Good. Um, let's see if I missed anything really important. Um, doesn't look like I did. Uh, standard doses, are you guys good with the standard adult doses for the medications that we've covered? Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about albuterol, what's our standard dose? 2.5 to 5 milligrams. Can we sometimes give more than that though? What if the physician were to ask, let's you'd say you had a, and you guys that did the asthma, when you did your research for your asthma presentation, did you hear about something called a continuous NEB or an hour long nebulized treatment? What do you, you guys hear? Where sometimes they will dump 10, 15, even 20 milligrams of albuterol. And they'll mix it in a large volume nebulizer, a heart nebulizer, sometimes they're called. And they will administer that continuously for an hour or even longer. Sometimes you will see that in asthmatic patients. Is that a, an improper way to administer albuterol? No, no it's not. Are there some risks? Yes, what are some of the big risks that we run into? Okay, tachycardia, anxiety, huh? Infection. Um, infection, not because of the albuterol, but because of the large volume nebulizer, right? And oh, they taught you that in the lab? Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, good. Um, because that's a big source of infection in the hospital, large volume nebulizer, because I have lots of fluid laying, laying around. Okay, good, good. Uh, what other problems are associated with giving these large doses of albuterol? What electrolyte can become imbalanced? Hmm? Potassium. potassium, right? Because that because albuterol causes a shift of potassium where? Potassium will shift where? Into the cell, right? Into the cell. Sometimes, and you may even see this next semester and you start if, if you get to go into the emergency room or ICU, sometimes patients that have hyperkalemia or very high potassium. Sometimes you may be called to give them albuterol to help in the treatment of that hyperkalemia. So that is yet another indication for albuterol. We just give albuterol for everything, huh? 
<laughs> and unfortunately, as you guys will find out next semester, albuterol is kind of like the fountain of youth. If a patient has a problem, they're going to call you. Okay, if the patient needs to be rejuvenated, they're 100 years old and they need to be rejuvenated, back to, to 18, getting ready for their prom. I'll be call you guys to get out the wrong. I kid you not. Um, so anyway, you run into that. Um, okay. Uh, I think we pretty much covered the major uh, things. We still have about ten minutes. Are you guys okay with your math? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think by by the last test, uh, I don't think there were any issues with the math problems. Uh, now, uh, what you may find is I've changed the concentration slightly because you're used to certain concepts, and I've changed them slightly, because I want to know that you are able <coughs> to work with things that are not standard. That you're able to walk in, and maybe you have, maybe you took report from a therapist, and that therapist mixed albuterol, or mixed a certain medication in a, in a way that's different than you're used to. I want to make sure that you're able to safely administer that, that different dose. Um, a lot of times, sometimes what we, we get into the habit of, Oh, that's an albuterol nab, 2.5 milligrams. Mm -hmm. We get in the habit of doing that, and then when something different comes along, or the physician says, hey, I, I, need, I need you to do this, and it's different from what you've always done, you can't cope. And you have, I don't want you guys to get in that habit. So um, just, again, nothing incredibly crazy. You know, I'm not going for craziness. I'm not going to intentionally deceive anybody, because I'm telling you guys you know, straight up what, what to expect. But I want you guys to be able to adapt if something interesting happens, something, something different happens. So. And just get into the habit, <coughs> next semester in clinicals, just get into the habit of calculating these things and doing these things because it is so easy to, to take things for granted. And it really stinks when you're in your last semester of respiratory school and the physician says, hey, I want you to mix this. And you're just, uh, it's just it, feel, it feels really bad. It feel really bad. <laughs> But uh, anyway, there's a lot of information that we need to cover. But uh, do you guys have any specific questions of me uh, in the last few minutes of what to expect? No cardiac agents. Will be oh, necessary. there there will be some cardiac agents. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, the primary, primarily, what I'm going to be asking is, are you able to differentiate between the different classes on the Vaughn Williams? Talk to the Vaughn Williams class. You have your class one agents, your one A, your one B, and your one C. 1A, your fast sodium channels, your B or your intermediate, and C or your slow. Uh, what are the class 2 agents? So 1 are your sodium channel blockers. Class 2 are? Beta blockers, maybe? What are, you, what are the class 2? Maybe beta blockers? Maybe? <laughs> Might want to look that up, huh? <laughs> class 3 agents are? are Potassium, right? You guys got that, the potassium, right? The class 1A and the class 3 agents are notorious for doing what? The class 1A and the class 3 agents are notorious for increasing the QT interval, and they can cause ventricular tachycardia, a special type called torsade de point, uh, which I'm not really going to go into at this point. Um, so the class 1A and 3 uh, can cause some cardiac, have a very significant pro-dysrhythmic properties, okay? Uh, be able to uh, kind of differentiate if, if I were to say, hey, what is lidocaine, for example? Okay, yeah, it's a class 1, right? So in class 1B, and amiodarone is a class 3 agent. Okay, um, you may be asked about, uh, and actually, no, that's about it. I'm not really heavily concentrating on cardiac agents for this exam. Again, because you're not really going to be using them a whole lot. Uh, however, in the uh, last year of school, you guys will actually come back to cardiac agents, and we'll talk about them in more detail because you guys have to get through ACLS, PALS, and NRP. Um, so, uh, specifically ACLS, we'll talk about those. So some of the, like the anti-thrombotic, the anticoagulant, the fibrinolytic agents, the cardiac agents, the blood pressure agents, all those agents that we covered, they will actually come back. They will come back. Um, but right now, uh, the big focus is on the respiratory agents and uh, safely administering them. Any other questions, guys? Okay.
Um, I'm going to cut it off. Guess what I ended up doing today? You, you guys will be very happy for this. I recorded the whole thing that I did here. Uh, hopefully I'll have it up on YouTube. So...